Hey, <laughs> good morning, and welcome to episode 71 of Talking to Artists, the casual conversation that we have weekly where we talk to artists about their inspiration, their lives, and basically the behind the scenes day to day of what's involved in being an artist today. So really excited today to talk to Roz Hermant. She is a Actually, she's hard to kind of put her finger on exactly what she is. Her background is in photography. She went to Emily Carr, um, but she's very much of a multimedia artist, and I love her real sense of play. So I'm really looking forward to chatting with her. A couple of key things this week. Thank you to everyone who came out to Art Walk in the Square. We had an incredibly glorious weekend. The weather was perfect. The people were great. Um, had so much fun, and we enjoyed the night market with the glow in the dark uh, glow sticks and stuff. This week, we've got uh, the North Toronto Studio Tour, so that will be actually at my house with Helen Utzel and Angela Lane, and about 40 other artists in the area of North Toronto, Young and Lawrence area. So excited to see you there. And uh, just a final reminder, if you are in Toronto, you have the opportunity to go down and check out the My Family Garden Show with my sister at Leslie Grove Gallery. That would be amazing. We are doing a second opening on Friday, this Friday, the 24th from 7 to 9, so COVID restrictions in place, but hopefully you can go see the show, grab a drink and hang outside in the park and chat. So I would love to see people. All right. So let's, uh, looks like Roz is here and I'm going to just go right in and invite her on to these days. Hey, hey, Dave. <laughs> how are you? Good. How are you? Good. I see you have one of those gorgeous holograms behind you. <laughs> the, uh, the gray day is illuminating it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm pretty excited to have mine. So um, I'm really excited that Roz is making a Luna Moth for me, which is uh, pretty iconic for me up here at the cottage. It's the first time that I've really seen a number of them, and they're so huge and they're so glorious. So <laughs> was it I'm excited to see that. Was it a bumper year for them up at your cottage? This year, no, I actually haven't seen them for a couple of years, um, but we used to see them quite regularly. And, huh. uh, you know, they're just so huge that they just kind of really take your breath away. And we have a place actually um, on the wall where the species is going to go that the uh, light kind of comes through. So it's constantly changing in the main windows. So I'm nice. super psyched to see it in place. Yeah, you'll get to live <laughs> with it and it'll constantly change as you live with it, which is so nice. I mean, I have these up on the wall, you know, in between shows and whatever. And uh, the, it always amazes me how different they can look in different lights. So. <laughs> well, and I love I love that whole concept, actually, of when you first look at it, it looks it seems so simple. You know, yeah. it seems like a really um, because when you don't have the light on it, it's it's cool, but it seems very simple, like you get it right. Mm -hmm. And then when the light hits it, all of a sudden, there's just a whole wow. other spectrum that you experience, which I just love. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I and I feel like so I feel like your stuff is kind of I don't know if this is just me reading into it, but it's kind of about play and that unpredictability and it's it's about play and it's about observation. I mean, I started as a photographer, so that was kind of my job was to observe and and play with light because ultimately mm -hmm. when you're a photographer, light is your medium. So that's kind of where it stems from. So I'm always sort of looking. I'm the person who's getting down on the ground and, you know, like laying on the grass in my yard and looking, oh, have you seen that cool bug? And look at what it's doing now. And hey, look how move, slow it's moving. And so that's sort of where this body of work came from. A lot of my work comes from there, but it comes from, you know, what it's like to see, like to really, really see and to continue to observe something over time. So yeah. that's uh, that's sort of the beauty of these pieces is, like I said, you do get to live with them and that they're constantly going to show you something new. Well, and I think it's also, I mean, maybe this is just me reading into it, but I kind of almost feel like that's what you did as kids. And it's especially at the cottage, you know, the classic is you, you turn over a rock and there's a tons of ants there and you watch them for like half an hour, right? Like yeah. you don't just kind of look at it, observe it, go, oh, those are ants, they're cool. They're kind of taking the regs over to safety. You literally sit and watch the whole thing and you start to watch their patterns and you start to follow a single ant. You realize some are really focused. Some seem to know not know what they're doing, you know? And, like, there's, <laughs> and there's something to that too, especially um, 
you know, coming back to it season after season. I mean, I grew up at our cottage, you know, it's been in my family for my whole life, uh, almost my dad's whole life. And, you know, you're coming back to the same places over and over again and checking. It's like, oh, there was a whole bunch of ants under this rock last year. Let's see if they're there this year. What are they doing yeah. now? Is it the same? <laughs> Is it a little bit different because, you know, it's a bit colder this year or whatever. So it's definitely like a it's a seasonal change and it, there's a rhythm to it that you start to understand the more you observe it. Mm -hmm. So I'm intrigued by that a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that too. And I think especially something like a family cottage, which has been in your, in the family the whole life. So you have this real connection to the land. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for me, it was so interesting this winter as people have heard me talk about is it's the first time that I've been at the cottage over the winter. And so there was a whole huge area of the land that I hadn't really previously observed except yeah. to come up maybe the occasional weekend and it's cold and you eat and drink and read and then you go home again you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been lucky enough to spend a whole winter up there but I've gone up for longer stretches of time uh, and I say longer like in the winter uh, it would be a weekend away like you said but you know maybe for a week or a week and a half or so and it's definitely a different world <laughs> mm -hmm. definitely and yeah. we've started, uh, our family winterized our cottage maybe like 13 or 14 years ago so that we could start going up in the winter a little bit more. So we've started spending more family Christmases up there and stuff like that. So we start to see the rhythm a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty magical, isn't it? Like to be able to spend Christmas and go into your own property and cut down your Christmas tree. You know, although I have to say our Christmas trees are super Charlie Brown wimpy Christmas trees, but they're still <laughs> ours. <laughs> <You know? laughs> we don't, we haven't cut down a Christmas tree um, because we're, my mom is very, very keen on, you know, keeping everything as pristine as it possibly can be. So we have a, yeah, we have like a Festivus pole that lights up in its own spectacular <laughs> way. <laughs> well, and we're a bit like that too, which is why the Christmas trees we do cut down are super wimpy. Like they're yeah. the ones that probably would die in a couple of years anyway with no light. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we had to go and buy super cheap plastic bulbs because they were the only things that didn't weigh down all the branches. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> so you obviously are Toronto based now in Peterborough, but I understand you also like almost everybody else spent a stint out in Vancouver and went to Emily Carr. <laughs> <laughs> I sure did. I, uh, when I graduated from high school, uh, not really super interested in art at that point. I was just kind of looking for, you know, a way to go off to university and sow my own path and try something really different. I had a few cousins who had gone out West to school and I was basically just looking to get as far away from what I knew as possible. <laughs> and uh, so I went out to Vancouver and went to UBC and actually studied English literature and physical geography. Um, oh. Yeah, so I started on a different path, not really knowing what I was gonna do with either of those, uh, but they were just sort of what I was kind of interested in at the time. So even then I was very interested in the natural world and looking at stuff and, you know, examining how things move you know really slowly over time and and uh, did a degree mm. there and realized that I probably wasn't going to end up being a teacher <laughs> which was sort of where the English literature teaching uh, or uh, course loads sort of led you into that path and right. I took took a year off and decided that I was going to finally travel I had had dreams from when I was a kid of going to the Amazon rainforest and wow. uh so I did. <laughs> oh, I, that sounds so cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I moved back to Toronto and I worked a couple of different jobs to save up money to uh, take this big epic trip to South and Central America. And that's really where I decided that photography was what I wanted to pursue. Um, and that that was what I was going to do when I got back. So I took shot a ton of pictures, had a ton of great adventures, did a lot of observing. And mm -hmm. uh and then came back and applied to Emily Carr. I went to Emily Carr and ultimately ended up studying photography there. So it must have been quite amazing to be, I mean, just talking about, you know, growing up in the land with the cottage, but it's still familiar North, or North Toronto kind of land that really talks to your soul sort of thing. It must have been so interesting to be in a place where everything was so completely different. It was, it was eye-opening, you know, like it was more than eye-opening. It was sort of mind-blowing. 
I had spent a lot of time when I was a kid. I was always sort of interested in photography as a kid. I just didn't, I don't think I realized it because I spent a lot of time in our basement with really old uh, issues of National Geographic. And my dad ended up giving me his old camera when I was about 10. And at that time, the two sort of married and I decided I was going to be a photographer for National Geographic. And I went around photographing like everything I could find with no film in the camera. It was just, you know, constantly <laughs> click, 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 click. And, but learning uh, to look and observe though, right? Learning to look and learning to observe and, and take the time to, you know, see how things changed. And, and that's, I think it was those issues of National Geographic that really told me that you have to go to the jungle, you have to go and see this. So when I went there, you know, I had seen a ton of pictures and done a bit of research on, you know, what I might like to go and see while I was there. But it was, it was nothing compared to immersing yourself in the experience and just having it all be so big and so loud and so consuming around you. And uh, it was, yeah, it was definitely a different experience. <laughs> One that I'll it's, never it, forget. Oh, I bet. It's interesting, though, that it just brings back to memory those iconic, almost everybody I knew had the iconic National Geographic yellow spined magazines. And uh, for me, it was Egypt that it was the same thing. I was yeah. obsessed with all things <laughs> Egypt. So I've tried three times to get to Egypt. Oh, <laughs> I yeah. still have, Not I yet. still haven't made it yet. <laughs> well, the last one was it was booked, you know, and then COVID hit. So I'm like, oh no, I was finally going to get to see the pyramids. <laughs> but oh, anyway. <laughs> no, I know. Thwarted, thwarted travels by COVID. We were, uh, yeah. my husband and I, we were supposed to be going to a few different places. We were supposed to be going to uh, Germany and France uh, mm. for a birthday celebration for his mom. And then we had also been planning like a big epic trip. We hadn't decided where yet. It was either going to be Bali, so more jungle, um, or Morocco. And we were just... We're supposed to go to Morocco too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we could have gone together. I know. Well, you never know. Maybe like, once this pandemic thing is behind us. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So uh, there were certainly big adventures planned, but now I've just been spending a lot of time in my backyard. <laughs> yeah. Um, building, you know, epic flower jungly gardens on my, you know, porch, <laughs> <laughs> which has also been a source of inspiration too. So but it's not the same. <laughs> no. So how did, uh, how did spending that much time in the jungle? And I'm sure you had some quite amazing experiences there. Did it change the way you looked at things or how you observed things when you came back to Canada? It gave me, it allowed me to see things from a different perspective. I think just because we were traveling so much in third world countries and, you know, I grew up in a nice neighborhood and went to a nice school and, uh, not living sheltered existence per se, because, you know, we had, our family had friends from all different walks of life. And, and so I was exposed to a lot of different cultures and different religions growing up. My dad, um, he uh, was running a, a music recording studio. So we were always, you know, hanging out with lots oh, of different cool. artsy folks and, you know, uh, experiencing different ways of living. But it was definitely eye opening down there. And I think because I was traveling and I wasn't having to work, it gave me the time to sort of sit back and really absorb what I was seeing and really opened my eyes to just all the things I didn't know, which really filled me with a sense of wonder, uh, even more than I already had. And I think that's what really propelled me to go to art school because it allowed you to sort of continue to explore that sense of wonder which is such a big part of what we do <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah you're right and I think that that it, people kind of forget that they get caught up in their day-to-day -day life and yeah. you know I think you know for me too I was just talking doing all these art shows and so part of it is talking about your practice and stuff like that and you know for me I only like to paint when I'm feeling joyful and the last two years that's been sometimes a challenge but <laughs> you know to your point earlier it for me it was about sitting down and thinking about what you have and what you're blessed to be surrounded with and what you mm -hmm. have gratitude for. And some of that is looking at your natural world through a little bit of a different lens. That's not quite so entitled, I think. Yeah, definitely. And it just, it, it made my appreciation just blossom and yeah, it just encouraged play and encouraged like 
if I could go anywhere in the world right now, I would. It doesn't even matter where. I would just, <laughs> yeah. I would go anywhere just to see it, just to see something new and to experience something that I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so do you have, a, do you have like a grandmaster place you'd love to go to? All of them. <laughs> I Cause, mean, because I, I'd love to go up to up north, like, you know, the Arctic Circle and see the Aurora Borealis. I hate the cold, but I just love that whole concept of, I don't know, just the color palette being so stark and yeah, beautiful at the same time. I like you, I, I'm not a big fan of the cold, but I've never seen the Aurora, Aurora Borealis and I would really love to. We've thought about Iceland a couple of times because we have family in Europe, so you can do the, you know, the bunny hop through Iceland. So that's been, yeah. that's been sort of rumbling around in my mind, but you know, I'm a sucker for anything lush and tropical. <laughs> <laughs> so you like the heat? <laughs> well, no, I actually really don't oh. love, <laughs> I love the heat. I like, I like sort of the middle range, <laughs> but, but uh, <coughs> there's just Excuse something me. so amazing about stuff that just gets so overgrown and so crowded and so densely packed. And it's just such an interesting ecosystem to see all these things, you know, living together in relative harmony, I suppose. Um, yeah. And, and the sounds, I love the sounds of those types of places, you know, that where the jungle just becomes so alive, it's almost deafening. So right. I, I think the two places that we were planning to go that we couldn't decide between, you know, sort of Bali and Morocco are both, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to planning. Those Pretty sweet. Yeah. 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 It's it's interesting though. You talk about kind of the whole lushness of, of the earth. And to me, it's a bit about the resilience of nature. Mm -hmm. And I kind of experienced that after I've been at the cottage for about three weeks and I go home and I'm like, Oh my God, it looks like I've been away for about seven years. Like the vines yeah. are going down the stairs and up through my porch and crossing the pathways. And it's just, it is a bit heartening to kind of see that how resilient nature is in terms of kind of taking back over. Uh, totally. And I think this year, I don't know if it's just because of the way the weather has been this year, this year has been particularly insane yeah. for that. Oh, sort it has of thing. been. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the birds too. I've been noticing, I guess it's because I've been home more in the summer this year, which I'm typically on the road a bit more doing shows. Um, but there hasn't really been anything, but the birds, the birds are taking over again. Like we've had, we've got <laughs> yeah. blue jays going crazy in our backyard, like just fighting over food. And normally they're quite shy and elusive, but they're yeah. definitely nature is winning this year. <laughs> <laughs> which good, is good. good to hear it, yeah. yeah it needs a win it needs a win a little bit <laughs> it, it totally did <laughs> and so you were saying that obviously at this time well we all would have been doing a lot of shows like I know every single uh, summer show is now compressed to September so we're all crazy busy <laughs> yeah. but I think you do you do shows in the U.S. as well right outdoor shows I do typically or typically <laughs> typically not not this year <laughs> I'm just sort of uh waiting I haven't actually sort of even really looked into crossing over the border yet um but uh oh sorry I thought I'd turn that to do not disturb um uh yeah I I typically do this year I'm fortunate that I have a couple of friends who've been who I've met at some of the outdoor shows in the United States who are representing me at some shows, which is great. Oh, that's so great. right now I have a uh, work up at the affordable art fair in New York city. And then I saw that. Yes. Which is really fun. I mean, I wish I could be there. I love New York. I wish I could go, but it's really nice that my work can at least be there uh, without me. Um, yeah. So hopefully next year we'll start getting back over the border. <laughs> And, and it looks like you're supposed to be doing affordable art fair in London as well. That yes, is it? yes. Are you? So I've, I've. This will be the first time I've actually had work in Europe. So it'll be interesting to see how it goes. It's always nice when you can put your work in front of a new audience. Um, yeah. You know, as artists, I think we spend so much time in our studios creating, and we're always in a bit of a void. So it's a bit strange to not have exhibitions and shows, and and. So it's always nice when new people can put their eyes on your work and hopefully gain an appreciation for it and tell their friends. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's like your little, your pieces get little wings and they fly off to different locations. <laughs> yeah. Although it's also a bit weird to have them there without you, you know, 
I was it, fine. Like it very much is. <laughs> <laughs> Especially liking to travel. I'm sure you're like me where you're like, Oh, I think I'd like to travel there. Can I do an art show there? Can I write it all off? <laughs> totally. <laughs> Those are all legitimate expenses. <laughs> totally. It's like, yeah. And how can we build in an extra few days to go here? <laughs> and be inspired. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Totally. That's part of the adventure. And, you know, whether it's by plane or by car, uh, I will, I'll go anywhere. Really? <laughs> yeah. I remember doing so, a show in uh, in Denver, in Colorado, and we just used it as we drove, and it was just an excuse to be able to go to New Mexico because it just wasn't that far from that at that point. Yeah. So. Oh, I know. I did our Barcelona many years ago now, but it was the same thing, and it was just before Christmas, and then we spent Christmas touring southern <laughs> Spain. So that was pretty bonus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And so what, which collection, I, I can see on your website too, you do a lot of different things. Like some of it is pure photography. Most of it's kind of multimedia. Which, what stuff is at the Affordable Art Fair right now? Uh, at the Affordable Art Fair, I sent um, some of the new wing pieces. I sent uh, some of the new neon vinyl pieces and the painted glass. So it's really the mixed media, you know, three-dimensional work that incorporates light. Um, mm -hmm. My representative was really, really excited to show that work. So it's not photography that's there. I'm involved in a local festival here in Peterborough called the Spark Photo Festival. It's kind of Peterborough's, you know, nod to the Contact Festival in Toronto. And this mm -hmm. one has been postponed, you know, a number of times due to COVID. Uh, but so it's a pure photography festival. Though what I'm showing oh, nice. is more um, mixed media because it's uh, photo based encaustic pieces uh, which was sort of a new experiment for me as well it is more driven by photography so right I just I think I I, I have a number of things going on at the same time because I just get bored and I know you <laughs> keep a number of different series going as well though yours are you know more done strictly with your painting but um, right before the pandemic I I don't know if there was a sixth sense or something, you know, sort of in January of 2020, I was sort of looking down the barrel of a quiet spring in the studio and thinking, okay, now's the time to maybe play with some new materials and try things out. So I ordered a whole bunch of different things just to play with. I didn't know what was going to come of it. And luckily I got them all before everything locked down because then there was oh, such yeah. a massive troubles with the supply chain getting yeah. supplies. So I was like, I was set and ready to go when the pandemic lockdown hit and I just played. So I sort of ended up playing with a few different things and that, had, that sort of resulted in a few different collections sort of launching at the same time as everything has come roaring back. And, you know, I've had four shows prepping for in September, all with different bodies of work that I had committed to it. So it got wow. a little hairy, a little crazy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, I totally get a, that. Yeah. It's in a good way, though, right? Like, I think... I think that when we're working hard and we have deadlines is when we really thrive. I think so, so. too. I mean, maybe not everybody does, but I absolutely do too. And I think that's one of the things that was a little bit hard during COVID where you're kind of sitting there and you're painting and you still have your ritual, but there's no real push to there's actually no get drive. things done or to, yeah. I mean, and sometimes too, that crazy busyness, I find, I don't know about you, but it drives um, innovation. Like it's like, I can't, I don't have yeah. time to do it the way I would normally do it. So I need to find a new way of doing it. And that actually creates something, sometimes something really beautiful. And sometimes you're problem solving really fast and on the fly too. You're like, okay, this yeah. isn't working, but I still have to get it done. The show waits for no one. It's going to go whether <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm there or not. So you kind yeah. of just, you figure out how to make it work. Which mm -hmm. is, you know, yeah. part. Of, I think that's part of the thrill of doing it. <laughs> I like that too. Like it's funny because yeah. I have a lot of you know. There's always people that say, "Well, you know, you could just be in galleries. You wouldn't have to do these things personally yourself." And I'm like, "But I kind of like that energy of the yeah. people, the unpredictability, the deadline, the and just well, just seeing what people buy and what they like and how they react to things too." But yeah, yeah I mean, that part it's, of it's fun. Totally, and it it de it depends. I mean, I work with galleries too, but you d you're not getting the feedback directly. Uh, when mm -hmm. you go through a gallery. I mean, you may have some discussion with the gallery representative, you know, telling you what people are saying or whatever, but there's nothing like putting, like laying yourself bare in front of everybody at a show to see what people are saying, what they think, you know, sort of like yeah. what, what they see, which is sometimes maybe things that you didn't even think about. Yeah. 
And I, I always think too, it, it, make, it makes good financial and business sense too to have multiple streams of annuity, right? So you have working yeah. with your galleries and have very good um, long-term relationships with those galleries, which is really important. Um, you kind of have your online stuff and then you have the things that are in person that I think sometimes for me help me kind of grow in different directions. And yeah. plus a lot of clients who buy at galleries, they come just to meet you, right? So they're obviously still yeah. the galleries clients, but they just kind of want to have some sort of connection with the artist, which is sort of fun. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, that's always a fun thing. <laughs> so I one, one of the other collections that I just love of yours, and I have to tell you, there's a couple of reasons I love it, are your paper dolls. So <laughs> first of all, they bring back such memories of like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of the oldest, obviously, and my sister's younger. And I used to make, I don't even know if she remembers, we used to do make paper dolls where you do the cardboard and all the dresses. And I used to do that when I babysat. But the other <laughs> thing I love are the stories that go with them. You know, like the, um, I think what, there's something about um my boyfriend said I looked like a cupcake and I smiled because that's exactly what I was looking for like I love that <laughs> playful cheekiness that goes with them <laughs> yeah I created those pieces they were kind of like a one-off I was looking to do something really different for um a first exhibition that I was doing in New York which I guess you were at that show too yeah um, that's where I think I first saw them I mean I remember watching you do all those tiny little flowers and flowers and flowers and like oh my god the patience <laughs> <laughs> there are some times that I take, okay, more than sometimes that I take on really, really repetitive, tedious tasks. <laughs> and, um, uh, sometimes my work can feel very Sisyphean to me, you know, like I'm just like constantly rolling that boulder up the hill. But um, I just, it was, it was all about the process of making them. And I just wanted something fun. I was kind of trying to embrace, you know, that it was going to be in New York City and, you know, go with sort of the fashion aspect of it, but really bring it back to, you know, the play again, you know? So like playing with these paper dolls when I was a kid and I, I had the paper dolls, but I also had a collection of Barbie dolls, which is funny because I'm not really a Barbie kind of girl, but all I wanted to do, I didn't need to buy clothes for them. I just wanted to make them outfits out of toilet paper. Like I just. Oh, totally. Uh, Scrap uh, material. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it sort of brought me back to that. But then I wanted to bring it into, you know, a more contemporary setting with the captions of what they were called. You know, like I can't. They're so long. I can't even remember them completely. Oh. I have to look them up. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other one was something like uh, when she packed this outfit, she thought it would travel better or something. It's all really wrinkly. <laughs> I think they're great. That, I love them. <laughs> that was, I think that was, I had started making the red flower dress first just because I was intrigued by actually creating a dress that is completely not wearable, but that we would all love to wear. You know, it kind of goes along with, you know, yeah. red carpet fashion. And I don't know if you've seen any of the images from the Met Gala. Um, oh yeah, the week, the but... worm thing. We can't forget that. Or oh, no, that wasn't the Met. That was the VMA award. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but but like you can't wear that in real life. So, um, I <laughs> no. was just, but we all kind of, at least I did, you know, always kind of wanted something like that growing up, but it's like, it's so impractical. So that's sort of where those captions started coming from. It's like, okay, these dresses are super crazy and totally ridiculous and totally impractical. So uh, even though yeah. I had started making the flowers for the red one, that wrinkly dress, that was, it was just, um, it was a big piece of rice paper that had gotten really wrinkled. So I thought, okay, I'll spray paint it down. And then you hear, you know, all kinds of catchphrases, like watching different, re I watch different reality TV shows just for inspiration, like competition ones where there's some sort of brief and they have to come up with a creative response. So, you know, if it's project runway or whatever. So you, I was thinking about, yeah. you know, there's, oh, it's a, it's a ready to wear, you know, travel leisure collection. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> that's sort of where that one came from. Like, but they don't really work like that. You pack it in your suitcase and you get there and you're like, oh my God, this looks like crap. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of like extreme fashion moments combined with reality and real life <laughs> yeah and do you do those still yeah I know you see you've got a series of like four of them were they were they just sort of a one-off they were a one-off I I have a fifth one that I haven't completed yet and I I haven't touched back to that yet though I would like to there's a few more that I would like to do so I just got carried away doing other things <laughs> <laughs> this is the problem with being, you know, somebody who's uh, focused, but not at the same time. Like I get 
I get caught up with a new material and I want to play with that. And, you know, I jump around a bit, which is perhaps not the best thing, but I'm always exploring. So mm-hmm. <laughs> it keeps well, things but interesting. But I think your stuff still has a, has a kind of a feeling and a, I don't know, an essence to it that feels like it's still your stuff. And I, I kind of agree with you. Like, I think it's nice to, you know, cause sometimes you have a, you have work that you've worked on, you really enjoyed and you find something new, but you haven't really quite finished with the old collection mm-hmm. yet. So it's nice, I think, to have that flexibility to go back and keep filling in those other collections still. I think so. And I know that people who collect, you know, specific series or whatever are always, you know, so thrilled if it's been a couple of years and then something pops back in again. It's like, oh, yeah, no, I've gone back to revisit this one. It wasn't quite done. So I'd like to, you know, bring that out again. It happens with my photography all the time. I mean, when I first started, I was photographing uh, figures out of focus. Um, and I still touch back to that all the time, you know, and release a new one once in a blue moon. But, you know, mm-hmm. as you're applying to the shows, uh, they either usually want you in one category or another. So it's difficult for me to show both um, styles of work. Although, as you said, I think if you see them together, you realize it's the same artist who's making them. Yeah. There's an aesthetic yeah. that sort of carries through. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And plus, I mean, that's part of the creative process. Sometimes they, they feed each other. It's funny because I was just thinking about um, uh, one of my original collections is uh, color field. So it was very thick textural work. And uh, I had a woman who came to Art Walk in the Square and she bought one of those pieces years ago. And I kind of thought, you know, I feel like I'd like to go back and revisit that. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think that there's a way of kind of upping the sophistication level from what I was doing, say, 10 years ago. But I still think it's got some really cool I don't know, textural elements that would be kind of fun to go back and explore. Yeah, and it gets informed by, you know, other things that you've been doing. If you've tried a technique yeah. with something else and you're like, oh, that would be really neat if I could apply that back to what I was doing before. Um, so it's always neat when you have collectors that sort of follow you through and actually can see the growth of your work yeah. over time, which is one of the best things about this job is somebody who has supported you from the beginning and continues to buy and support as you grow because they're growing with you. Yeah. Well, and, and it was, I, I don't know what it was about art walk in the square, but I had a lot of people that came out who, you know, first saw me like, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 years ago. Right. And they yeah. were able to remember these shows. And I'm like, Holy cow. First of all, such an honor to have people remember you from that long yeah. ago. Right. And it's, you've kind of sort of affected their life a bit. But uh, also you just kind of realize how far you've come and I don't know, bring all those people along on the journey with you, you know? Totally. And there's nothing more rewarding than some, than, you know, having champions in your corner, just sort of like cheering you on and looking forward to seeing what you're going to make next. And they come out to all the shows and come and chat and want to catch up. You know, they, they become friends along the way, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Which yeah. is wonderful. I had that too, though. I definitely noticed that at Art Walk in the Square. I don't, I don't know if it was just everybody was so raring to go to come out and do something in person or what. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so what else, what, where else do you sell your work? Like, how do you kind of, uh, kind of flipping it over a little bit to the business aspect of your, your work? And obviously <laughs> you have, um, I guess you've got prints and you do workshops and you've got galleries that represent you. How do you kind a- of structure that? it actually formed somewhat organically. You know, I, when I graduated, I um, didn't really know what I was going to do. Unfortunately, Emily Carr at the time was not really so great in preparing us for, you know, the realities of running a business as an artist. I think we had one. I still don't think they are. Yeah, (laughs) possibly not. I think they concentrate on the art part of it, which is wonderful. But um, unless you're going into sort of a granting stream where you're relying on grants and doing grant applications and stuff to um, get funding to make your work, uh, it's the, there's a bit of a gap in the education there. So I graduated and didn't mm-hmm. really know what I was going to do. I, um, I worked at a fine art photography studio for a while, which is where I learned how to do framing. I didn't 
I got out of school and I didn't know how to frame anything. And I was in photography. Like, I think we learned how to cut mats one day, you know, and we never well, really. I, I, I majored in photography as well. I don't know if you knew that, but we didn't I even did learn not. that. <laughs> oh, <No>. wow. <laughs> I think I might have skipped that class. I don't know. <laughs> Which is terrible. Because even when we were doing critiques in class, like, we didn't have to have our work finished. It was just, you know, tack your photo on the wall and, and go. So when I graduated, um, I ended up working at a fine art photography labs and studio. I was hired as a darkroom assistant and um, their framer had just quit. So my boss threw me into the framing room and he said, oh, you're going to thank me someday, which I was, you know, sort of grumbling under my breath, you know, <laughs> messing up mat after mat after mat. But he's right, because when I realized, you know, the cost of framing work, um, and I was trying to get started as a full-time artist, I was so grateful that I knew how to do it and that I could, you know, build my own frames and, you know, cut all the mats and fill them myself. And I think that skill definitely has led me to some of the work that I'm making, making now, because if I wasn't able to do the framing component, I wouldn't be able to incorporate the framing and the glass into the work as I've started right. to do. So, I mean, that was certainly an education there. And I started doing, I started doing outdoor shows a couple of years after I graduated, I had had a couple of shows in, in galleries, um, you know, group shows and whatever. And I started doing the out, outdoor shows and it really made me realize that I could have a lot more control over what I was making, how I was displaying it, the conversations I was having, how I could talk about my work. And that was, it was quite eye opening. I mean, I didn't even know there were outdoor shows when I was in school, <laughs> you know, it didn't, it just didn't really occur to me that that's how you could sell your work. So those became sort of the foundation launching point for me to develop relationships with different galleries who ultimately ended up carrying my work and, and, uh, and being open to sort of exploring different opportunities that maybe I hadn't really thought of. You know, I mm -hmm. always thought before, it was just like, okay, well, you have shows in a gallery and that's what you do. And if galleries aren't keen to carry your work, um, you know, for whatever reason, you don't fit their model or whatever, then what do you do? You have to figure yeah. out a way to, to sell it yourself. So, so certainly outdoor shows and now indoor art fairs and stuff are definitely a part of a part of my whole business model and working with galleries and workshops kind of came organically uh, just from people at shows saying, Hey, would you teach me how to do this? I mean, I, I switched gears after English literature because I didn't want to be a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and then here there were all these people at shows going, hey, will you teach me how to do this? So, um, I mean, I don't do a ton, but I do teach locally a few, you know, courses once or twice a year when they're running. And then I do run a workshop from my home uh, on occasion, usually by on demand. Uh, it's typically like this time of year, like, you know, we get into October after I've done my studio tour and the September shows have kind of settled down a bit that I'll, that I'll run one. I'm not sure about this year. I don't know if anybody out there wants to take one and we'll be COVID safe and whatever, reach out, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. So those are sort of the main, the main points of my business model. I mean, I've worked with designers before to do commission pieces for commercial spaces. So I love that part too. I, I love working with people to make custom pieces that I, that they're going to love. I want people to mm -hmm. love what they buy. So, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> and I think it's, it sounds like that's, you know, you've kind of, kind of got a very varied sources of income, but also sources of kind of tapping into client, future clients and relationships and being mm -hmm. open, I think, to things like uh, commissions, which is for some artists freaks them out because there's a lot of uh, variables in that scenario. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like that's been really working well for you. And I think, I would agree. I think it's a good way to, if you can, to try and do that. You know, I just, I love the collaborative part of it, you know, that somebody says to me, and mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but there were a ton of discussions about commissions at the show this past weekend. People were very oh, impressed. Yeah. Lots and lots, more so than usual, it felt like, you know, people were I found loving the new work and they were like, oh, have you ever considered this? Do you only do wings? Would you do something like this? So I, 
you know, definitely I came home from the show with like a ton of different ideas firing on all cylinders because the wings are so new. They've only been wings thus far, but uh, you know, I've been thinking about how to play with this material in other ways. So it's always interesting when you meet a collector who has a bit of an idea in mind and they love what you do and trying to figure out how to marry the two together is it's an interesting creative challenge that, uh, yeah. you know, sometimes goes smoothly, sometimes doesn't, but <laughs> that's, that's all well, part of it. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's for me why I have a, a zero risk commission policy, right? Because sometimes things do take on a life of their own or they don't work out as intended. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, at least that way you can still, you can still follow it through yourself as an artist. And if the end user or the end client doesn't totally love it, well, at least you've got something that's interesting that hopefully will appeal yeah. to somebody else. Right. Yeah. <laughs> can we talk about, Oh, I just see, I'm seeing the questions. I just read, realized yeah. there's questions at the bottom. Talk about how I make the wings. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a. Uh, if you don't have a question to ask me, I'll I'll fill in here. <laughs> well, be open. Yeah. It's uh, a. <laughs> it's um. It's a a PVC vinyl. It's, so it's a plastic material that is used by fashion brands to make uh, like raincoats and bags and wallets. So it's it's thick, but it's still flexible. So I um I bought the material just because I was curious about it and I didn't know what I was going to do with it and I sort of hung it on the wall for a couple of months near a sunny window just to see what was going to happen and uh, I really started thinking about insect wings and how you know they can become iridescent and different light and whatever so depending yeah. on how you're looking at it and I thought these would be great as wings especially if um, I create them to sort of look like specimens you know when they're they're pinned open after they're gone and they're in these frames which is both kind of creepy but also stunning at the same time <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> so uh, I started playing with the material and I cut strips that are about an inch thick and then I carve into foam core as the background there and it gets slotted in and then all joined together um, either with glue or in the case of the neon pieces that some of you may have seen I actually am melting them together I'm soldering them um, so each join takes, you know, when I'm using the glue takes about half an hour to an hour to fully set and cure. So I've, you know, developed all these weird little tools and shims and props and clips that hold things in place <laughs> as they're drying. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a mess while I'm making it, but the end result is they look, you know, they're so clean and stunning and simple. Uh, sometimes I think people don't realize how much goes into doing that. You know how hard it is to lean on foam core for like a hundred hours and not get it dirty. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow yeah I think but I think a lot of like that stuff it, it, that's often the way right things that look like they're super fast to do it's just like there's a lot of thinking and process around behind yeah. that stuff which is you know honestly one of the reasons that I really wanted to do talking to artists because I think some of it is about helping collectors understand what goes on behind the curtain to actually create yeah. these pieces and there's so much of this concept of especially with a painter I think that oh you're just born with the talent. So you just sit there and it comes out perfectly and not fully appreciating That's just all the, the tip of the iceberg. And the thinking. I think yeah. the talent is just the tip of the iceberg, you know, and it's, it's the creative problem solving to figure out the execution of how you can ultimately bring it to the end place where it looks the way you want it to look. And, that's part of the magic of art and the wonder is that, yeah. you know, there's so much that goes into it, but unfortunately, as a result, a lot of people don't see it, which is what, like you said, what is great about these conversations you're having is that artists get to sort of fill in the blanks a little bit and, you know, Instagram and social media and, you know, reels and IGTVs and stuff like that allow us to sort of show a little bit more about the, the less glamorous side of what goes into making it. <laughs> what we made right <laughs> yeah I remember I worked with a guy years ago and he always used to say that because I was in marketing it's like you know our role as kind of like you know, on the executive as marketing is to be like a duck so from the client's point of view everything's like super smooth and underneath the water you're just like paddling furiously <laughs> to make things happen I, like <laughs> I, feel that. Sometimes, I feel like it's kind of arts a bit like that too right like I think the creativity and being born with the talent is the driver that keeps you pursuing it, but it doesn't give yeah. you the skills and the ability to actually be able to produce stuff. Right? No, not at all. <laughs> That's usually <laughs> a lot of trial and error, perhaps a few tears, uh, <laughs> some frustration. Yeah. <laughs> 
And just like you said, that's the, it's the drive that keeps you going to get you to the end result where you're like, okay, this is the way I wanted it to be. And uh, now yeah. I'm ready for it to, you know, go out into the world. And are your workshops, are they to do these hologram wings or are they are you workshops on multimedia uh, stuff for photography? Or? Yeah, I mean, I'll teach a workshop on whatever people want to learn, really. Um, <laughs> I, I had, some, it's funny, I had some requests for workshops with this material uh, over the weekend. And I was like, wow, I feel like maybe I'm not an expert enough to teach this yet. I'm still <laughs> learning and playing this material, playing with this material myself. But um, typically it's doing resin, which you're an expert at yourself. So I get. No, <laughs> <laughs> not really. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've taught a lot of resin workshops. Um, one of the things that I'm teaching right now is uh, it's a photo based mixed media class. So it's basically, you know, how to take your photos that, you know, people maybe don't love or they look like everybody else's photos or whatever and turn it into something that's truly unique and, you know, different and one of a kind using just different materials that we play with. So I encourage people to come to the classes and just play. And like, let's not worry about a super fantastic finished product. Let's mm -hmm. play with stuff and see where that exploration takes us and embrace the happy accidents because art is a little bit about that too. <laughs> oh, you're totally speaking my language. That's, and that's exactly what our creative adventures business is about too. Like helping people to kind of tap into that play and the enjoyment of creating without being so fussed about the end product. Yeah, because I think, you know, if you just truly are enjoying what you're doing and having a good time with the play, the end product is going to come. Like it'll I think come, so too. maybe not right then and there, but you're going to have ideas popping off all over the place that is going to send you to the spot where you ultimately want to end up. Or maybe not. Yeah. Maybe it's a different spot you didn't know you'd end up at, and you like that too. <laughs> Well, and maybe you tap into the creativity and you decide, yeah, I love that. And now I'm going to do opera singing or whatever else, right? Like it doesn't necessarily have to be within that realm. No. So are you ever, I get asked this question a lot, actually, um, not that I really teach, but are you ever concerned that by teaching someone, for example, you've spent a lot of time figuring out how to use this holographic material and how to make it attach and how to keep the phone core white. Are you afraid about that by doing these um, workshops that it's easy for other people to duplicate what you do? I, I think at the beginning, I was worried about that. Um, and then once I started teaching, um, it always amazes me when I'm teaching the workshops and stuff, you know, how I can give everybody, all the students, the same materials to work with. And the end result is so completely different. I'm always blown away by that. So I think even if there's you know, people who come into that workshop thinking perhaps, you know, oh, I wanna learn what she does so I can do it too. If you really sort of foster that sense of play, they're going to go in a different direction. They're going to find something right. else that they want to do with it because maybe they wanted to know exactly how I did it. But ultimately, maybe making wings is not for everybody. <laughs> you have to look at a lot of bug pictures for this. And let me tell you, the wings might be beautiful, but I'm not so crazy about the bodies. But the rest. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, as long as you're really encouraging that sense of play, um, it'll take care of itself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, believe it or not, we're almost out of time. So oh my God, this I, flew always, by. <laughs> I know it always does. That's why I have to have a timer on now because I've done this before. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> it's, it's late. <laughs> so I always like to end my interviews with if money, time, COVID, travel were no option, what would your big hairy ass goal be? I was thinking about this question and it's really hard for me to come up with an answer for this <laughs> right now. I think because COVID has groomed me to not really plan too far in the future. But it really, I think, ultimately would just be to travel, like just pack a bag and never come back and find different places and create art, you know, inspired by those places. So it's just to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm I, I've the goal is underway. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. That's always yeah. the best way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, and so maybe. <laughs> I know money wasn't an option with the Harry Askell. Oh, right, right, right. Fair enough. <laughs> well, and I, I guess unless it was just to win the money. <laughs> well, I'd win the money and just like spread it around to people who need it. <laughs> spread joy. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. That'd be fun. That'd be fun. Yeah. <laughs>
All right. Well, thank you so much. Oh, maybe just share with people what your Instagram handle is, how to find you, oh, okay. stuff like that. Well, it's pretty easy. You can find me on Instagram at roshermont.com, not dot com, roshermont. Um, that's, it's H-E-R-M-A-N-T. It rhymes with Vermont. But, uh, and my email address or, or website is uh, roshermont.com. Super okay, easy. so you're yeah. easy to find. Nothing I'm super easy to find. <laughs> crazy about that. No, okay. no, not at all. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I've really loved chatting with you, and I look forward to seeing my wings in my space. Soon. Coming <laughs> soon to you. <laughs> no, no rush. No rush. I know you got a lot of other stuff going on, so I know they'll look amazing once they get here, but don't add awesome. that extra stress to your life. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Kate. All right. Thank you so much, and we'll talk to you later. Bye. And uh, coming up... Next week, we've got uh, Ed Baptista. So he does these uh, really cool figurative pieces. When I originally met him, he did a lot of uh, wrestling, almost really washes, very loose pieces. Um, and he's moved into a little bit of a different technique now. So I'm looking forward to hearing all about that. After that, we have Todd Monk, who is probably best known for his nudes and swimming pools, um, really kind of uh, modern and contemporary. And recently, he's been doing these really elegant, lovely portraits of hands, which I think are so super cool. Anyway, hopefully you'll join us on that. Uh, this will be on my, eventually on my YouTube, um, youtube.com slash Kate Taylor art. And we are slowly trying to get them on the podcast. So you can find that anywhere you listen to your podcasts. If you have a chance, I would love it if you would subscribe to my YouTube channel, subscribe or comment to my podcast, which is talking to artists and I'll leave a comment. Tell me if there's someone you would like to hear from. If you're an artist who'd like to be on the show, then let me know. Or if you know somebody who you think would be really cool and interesting and has a fun story to tell, I would love to talk to them. So have a great day. We will possibly see somebody on Friday at our opening, if not next weekend, North Toronto Group of Artists show, or we'll talk to you next week online. Have a great day. Bye.